All right. All right. Well, hello. I'm glad to be here with you all. My name is Christina Dunning. Um, Ava's mom and I work together at St. Francis, and so her mom started asking around, hey, do you know anybody that would be willing to talk? Would you go talk about what you do? Sure. So here I am. I'll try not to uh, bore you guys. And I forgot your candy at home. I brought, I had candy for you, but anyways. Um, but you can go to the next, go to the next slide. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm married to Jared. He's a farmer. We live near Advance, Missouri. Uh, my kids attend Advance. We've got four kiddos and two dogs. I graduated with my associate's degree um, of Associates of Applied Science from Three Rivers Community College in 2004. So that's how I started out as a nurse. I got an associate's degree. Um, and then I returned to school and completed my BSN in 2007 through SEMO. And I am now working on a master's degree in nursing for leadership and management um, online through a program at Western Governors University. So my kids and school and work keep me busy. Go to the next one. And this is just some pictures. This is my family. My oldest daughter's graduated. I have one that plays volleyball. We started back to school and the dogs. We run cross country. We got basketball, all kinds of fun things going. You got the next one. So I work at St. Francis. Everybody knows about St. Francis in Cave. Everybody's seen it, right? So St. Francis is now what we call a health system. It used to be called the medical center. It was just one place, but most of the hospitals around have expanded. Um, your ones out of St. Louis, your ones out of Springfield. And a lot of times you'll see the same name over a lot of different clinics and outpatient areas and plus a big medical center. So they're called, we're called St. Francis Health System. Uh, we're the largest healthcare system between St. Louis and Memphis. There's th we have 306 beds, we're nonprofit, we serve 29 counties uh, in Southeast Missouri, Southern Illinois, Western Kentucky, and Western Tennessee. Um, and my roles at St. Francis over the years have changed. So I started uh, in 2004 right out of nursing school on PCU, which is our progressive care unit. And we take care of heart patients. So if you had a heart attack, you have congestive heart failure, we might well take care of you there. Um, from there, I went to ICU and dialysis. Um, ICU, I've done all kinds of things. We're going to look at some cool pictures here in a minute. Um, I've worked with traumas, surgical patients, um, heart patients, a variety of medical conditions. We see all kinds of things in the ICU. And then dialysis uh, was specific to those patients that are in kidney failure. So we would take care of those patients in the hospital. Um, and then a few years ago, I took a job as a clinical documentation improvement specialist. And in a little bit, we'll talk a little more about that. And then recently, since I said I would come here, just within the last month or so, I transitioned to what we call a performance improvement specialist. So I'm going to tell you all just the little bit that I know about that role. Okay? Go to the next one. So I always like to give a little history of nursing. Who do you think the first nurse was? Anybody got any ideas? What's that? Florence Nightingale is who we think of for our modern day nursing. Okay, She's what they teach us in school where nursing started. But really the first nurse probably back in the day was somebody's mom. Right? I mean, as far back as you go, they've been caring for patients, been caring for people. Um, we've had midwives for years and years and years. So, you know, a midwife helps deliver babies. Um, and before that was even a recognized degree as part of nursing, we had midwives all across the United States, all across Europe, Asia. We've had women um, doing that. So even, even before Florence, but modern day nursing really came along um, with Florence Nightingale. So Florence Nightingale was uh, a British nurse and her family um, was very wealthy, um, very high in society. And nursing at the time that Florence came along was really a profession that was looked down on. Only kind of the lowest part of society went into nursing. Okay, so Florence's family was like, no, this is not for you. Um, you're not doing this. But she 
insisted this is what she wanted to do, and she enrolled in nursing school in Germany in 1844. Um, she was a social reformer, and she loved statistics. Anybody take stati statistics? Did you guys have statistics in high school? You like it? Mm -hmm. Just love it? It was not my favorite thing in nursing school. But Florence, she really liked it. She liked looking at the things she was seeing and trying to figure out what's going on, what changes can we make, and how does that affect our patients. So she was the, she's the founder of our modern day nursing. And she returned to London in the early 1850s. Um, and she went to work at a hospital. And she really worked with unsanitary conditions as well as a cholera outbreak. Um, so unsanitary conditions in the 1850s, if you can think about things like, um, you know, we had no indoor plumbing, no bathrooms, um, the water systems were infiltrated with all of that, um, all kinds of diseases and things that they probably really couldn't even classify at that time, but they made people very sick. And so she was involved with all of that. Um, she really had a mission to improve hygiene and to improve patient outcomes with improved hygiene. And then the Crimean War broke out in the early 1850s and Florence, uh, she went to nurse on the front lines. Um, at that time they didn't send nurses to the front lines, they had like uh, medical nurses within their armies, but not, not women in particular. But Florence became known the lady with the lamp because she nursed these soldiers night and day, and she'd be seen carrying around her lamp, checking on them. So one of the big things that Florence found when we were doing surgery on those soldiers was nobody washed their hands, like ever, and they didn't have gloves, like we all have gloves now to put on. They didn't wash their hands. So when she recognized that we're not washing our hands and she thought she would see that this kind of infection spread from this patient to this patient to this patient, she's like, hey, why don't we try washing our hands? And she got the other nurses and mainly those surgeons. I don't know if you guys have been around doctors much, but they don't really like a lot of times for nurses to tell them what to do. She talked these guys into washing their hands in between their surgeries. She cut their infection rate by two-thirds just by having people wash their hands. It was unbelievable. And so the, the big movement for good hygiene came from Florence there. She was a pretty amazing lady. So if you want to go ahead and go to the next slide. I think the only knowledge I had of Florence Nightingale was Florence Nightingale syndrome, like mm -hmm. where people fall in love with their nurses. Uh -huh. I had no idea she contributed all that. She's... She did. She contributed a lot. If anybody goes to nursing school, you're going to spend probably a whole semester or part of your semester talking about Florence. You're going to know. They even used to give us little lamps when we graduated. That was like a symbol of nursing. So after the Crimean War, um, she helped establish St. Thomas Hospital and the Nightingale Training School for Nurses in 1860. She helped nursing become viewed as an honorable profession. It was no longer just the low part of society. Um, but anyone could now start becoming nurses. She advocated for health care reform. She served as an authority on public sanitation, and she dedicated her life to improving health care and alleviating patients' suffering. So Florence herself fell ill when she was about 36, which seems young by today's standards, but in her time, um, that was probably getting to be kind of old with all the things they had to deal with. But even from the bed, she was bed-bound for a long time. Um, she would write papers and letters and try to make sure that um, she still advocated for her patients. Oh, good. What's wrong? Oh, that's okay. If it'll stay on there, I'll, we're good. So what is a nurse? How many of you know a nurse? Everybody probably pretty well, right? You got school nurses running around here, I know, somewhere. Um, probably each one of you could tell me that the nurse you know, what, what they do is a different kind of nurse. Your options are endless out there. But a nurse, by definition, is a person trained to care for the sick or infirm, especially those in a hospital. But we have nurses everywhere, right? You got nurses in schools, nurses at doctor's offices, nurses at counseling center, nurses at camps, I mean, operating rooms, emergency rooms, the list 
almost seems like it becomes endless. Um, so uh, th some of the different types of diplomas or certificates, you can have an LPN, which is a licensed practical nurse. So some of you may be like, hey, want to go to school. So over at the Career and Technology Center, they have an LPN program. You want to get through it in that nine months to a year, get out, get to work in, and then go back and get your registered nurse, your bachelor's degree later. So a lot of people do that. Um, registered nurse. So a couple ways to become a registered nurse. There are a couple of diploma programs still in Missouri. Then there's those associate degree programs. And then the one you probably hear the most about is getting your bachelor's degree in nursing. Anybody going to school for nursing? Yeah, maybe. You checked out schools yet? Know where you want to go? No? So we got SEMO right here, um, not far. They have a bachelor's degree in nursing. We have uh, the college, Southeast College of Nursing, which is an associate degree. But then I think you can also finish your bachelor's. And I just saw where they have, um, they just had a group of high school students come in today, I believe, to see their nursing program and their lab and whatever. So if you're interested and you're not really sure, call them up and book a date and go check it out. Um, the hospitals. So uh, St. Francis offers camp stat in the summertime if you're interested or know anybody that's interested in healthcare fields you can come in and hang out brianna did with us for a week we certify you in cpr and first aid and you get to go visit a few places where did you visit uh for like for the um what's it called shadowing day yeah i went to the er and then i went to the third floor tower on the orthopedics okay floor so. and both of those places were really fun if you do get to do camp stat i would suggest it because i had a blast it. yeah Actually, it's really, really fun. Yeah, it's it pretty really fun. fun. It's um, very educational, but it was really fun. My oldest is a sophomore this year, and well, my oldest that's still in school is a sophomore. She doesn't really know what she wants to do, but thought radiology sounded kind of cool. So she got to go watch um, some interventional radiology where they use the x ray machines they have to actually perform procedures right there on the patients. She got to watch some procedures. It was cool. She went to the NICU. We had some that followed. I think some physicians around went to surgery, went to ED, um, lots of opportunities. And I believe Southeast still has a program, something similar to that. But if you're interested, you don't know, reach out to those departments um, at the hospitals. Uh, ours is called Learning and Development or their Education or their Training and Development Departments. They can probably hook you up with a shadow day over Christmas break if you're really considering it. Um, but anyways, types of nursing, like we already talked about, acute care nurses, critical care nurses, mental health nurses, oncology nurses, the, there's a, just a huge variety of things you can do. Um, yep, we're good. We can go to the next one. Okay, so I put up some things um, that I've done over my nursing career. Sorry, I keep forgetting to move in this way. I worked in the ICU. Um, after my year on PCU, I went to ICU. I was really interested in critical care. In nursing school, that's where I did um, like my internship at the end of nursing school. That's what I wanted to do, take care of those patients that are critically ill um, for whatever reason. So I went to St. Francis, did my year on progressive care, learned some basics, and then transferred to ICU. And that's where nursing got really fun for me. Um, I took care of patients. I put it on if you can see the picture very well. This is what walking into an ICU room probably looks like on any given day. You walk in and you've got a dialysis machine over here and your heart monitor up here and we've got one, two, three, four, probably at least five or six IV pumps and we have a ventilator over here and we probably have some kind of equipment down here at the foot of the bed and your room is never big enough like ever. There's um, this patient has um, an ET tube, so that is ventilator. That's what's helping him breathe. He's got lots of other tubes um, attached for the IVs. Probably has a Foley catheter to drain his bladder. Um, and then the dialysis machine is actually doing the work of his kidneys by cleaning the blood. And so that's something else that I did. Um, these patients are difficult to take care of. You got to be on your game all the time. You got to be able to critically think about what's going on with your patient. 
anatomy and physiology that didn't seem quite so important in college becomes super important when you start thinking about everything that could be going on with these patients. Um, you look at a patient and we see from the outside the signs and symptoms of what's going on inside their body and you've got to be able to put those pieces together. Um, you're the eyes and the ears for the physician. No doctor stays at the bedside 12 hours a day or 24 hours a day. What you have at the bedside are nurses. Nurses that are trained to look for things. They're the eyes and the ears for the doctor so I can call the doctor up and be like, hey, this is not going right. Something feels off. Um, and sometimes it's just a feeling. And sometimes I've put lab work and whatnot together and said, hey, we have an issue here. What are we going to do? Um, so that's what my day typically looked like when I walked into the ICU. And I liked caring for the patients that had all of that and as much more as you could get. The more stuff, the better for me. That was what I enjoyed. So I, uh, most of these patients are intubated. A lot of them in the ICU, they can't talk to you. Um, we keep them sedated, keep them asleep while you're on all this. You don't want anybody waking up remembering all this mess. That's no fun. Um, you work with their families a lot. You know, it's scary to walk in and see your loved one laying in the bed with all this stuff going on, wondering what's going on. So you do a lot of education with families and teaching about what's going on with the patient. You work with the doctors, you work with speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, oh my goodness, dietitians, all the different um, disciplines within healthcare. So if nursing's not for you and you are interested in healthcare, there's lots of other disciplines out there. You can go to the next one. I can't remember. Oh. So these were always interesting patients as well, so I thought I would put them up. So this is a patient um, that's been in an accident of some sort. I'm not sure. It could have been a fall. could be a car accident. could be an ATV accident. Um, again, has a ventilator, has the collar on to support his neck and keep, him, keep that neck from moving, keep it stable. Um, and then he's got... I believe a ventriculostomy. Whoops, coming out. Oh, my bad. Got too close to my finger. Ventriculostomy coming out right up here on top of his head. So then. This not so sensitive. Sorry. No, you're fine. Bring it back. You're good. It's kind of hard to see. There we go. So ventriculostomy up there. So ventriculostomy, your brain is split into two halves. Okay, so you have a right side and a left side. And then within that, you have four ventricles. You have two ventricles up here on top, and then you have two ventricles underneath. So there's one, two, three, four ventricles. And those ventricles are where your spinal fluid circulates down through your spine and back up through your brain, okay? So when you have an accident, like this guy, we're gonna, he's got head trauma, okay, of some sort from falling or being in a car accident. Sometimes your CAT scan will look something like this, okay? So on the left is what our brain should look like, okay? Nice, symmetrical, no big deal. Here's our ventricles, those two little dark, and then there's two more underneath. This is a head that's had head trauma. Do you have this white stuff over here is blood, so we've got bleeding in there that is causing the brain to shift. Okay, so now our nice straight line down the middle, it's all shifted and our ventricles can get collapsed and our brain swells. So we put in this tube called a ventriculostomy. And it's like a little bitty catheter right into the ventricle. And as the ICU nurse, I connect that to my monitor. The doctor puts it in, we connect it, and I can read his intracranial pressure. Okay. So intracranial pressure, you and I sitting here today, is somewhere probably between 0 and 20. If I start coughing really hard, my intracranial pressure will go up between 25, maybe 30. And I stop coughing, it comes down. So you know how your head hurts sometimes if you get to coughing really hard? Your pressures went up there in your brain. For this guy, if his brain starts to swell, there's not as much room in there, his pressure is going to go up. Which tells me, as his nurse, my monitor's saying it's like 30, and I'm starting to see other signs and symptoms. Maybe his blood pressure's going really high. 
and your heart rate will go really high. And there's different symptoms that we see that tells us we're, we've got way too much swelling in the brain. We got to do something. Yes. So the ventriculostomy, it, it doesn't actually drain anything. Yes, it, there are it, certain types that will. But this one you have here measures the pressures. That so have? ventriculostomies will measure, okay. and then some of them will also drain. Oh, wow. okay. Some physicians will choose to use that type, and then there's other types that only measure gotcha. the pressure. So the ones that I used, um, we used two types in the ICU. We had doctors that liked the draining kind. And so they would write us an order that says, hey, if they sustain their ICP, their intracranial pressure, of greater than um, 25 for so many minutes, I want you to drain a mill of fluid, so CSF. And it has a little graduate on it, and you can open up the valves and let it drain just a little bit. It, would it be mingled with the blood or is it separate? No, nope, it's that? separate. It's in its own separate system. Okay. Uh, now, it can get blood in it depending on the type of injury you yeah. have. You might see a little pink tinge, but it's in this particular instance, you're between the epidural and the subdural you're in space, epidural lining of the brain, and so it wouldn't be mixed in with the ventr ventricles. So there's like, but. isn't there usually like about 150 mils total, top to bottom? Of CSF? Yeah. Yeah. And so five five's a pretty good amount, I guess. Yeah, if you if even a mill is yeah. can make a significant difference. So our orders would usually say to drain like one mill at a time and then yeah. you wait and see. You don't wanna we never leave it open to drain. How um, fast does it that respond usually? Um it depends on uh, like how fast does it take the pressure down? Yeah. Almost immediately. Wow. Usually okay. as soon as you start draining off some it'll relieve some of the pressure. Wow. Um, we also use another type of, um, it's not a, it's called a Camino Bolt, so it's just a monitoring system, and there are tons of different types out there, that's just what we have at St. Francis. Um, but, really interesting patients to take care of, and these folks have so many things going on, a lot of times you're also dealing with broken bones, um, you know, legs, pelvises, um, I've seen patients that so if you have a patient like this and the pressure just gets too high and you can't keep it down by draining, sometimes we would do surgery and do what they call craniotomy. And craniotomy, and I don't think I have a picture of that on here, but it's where they would actually uh, make a cut, usually on the side of the head, and take out a piece of the skull. And they either freeze that piece of skull to put it back in later, or you can put it in the patient's abdomen to keep the bone healthy. And they would allow the brain to swell until, until that goes away, and then they go back later and put the, put the skull back in. I so. have no idea that A, they would freeze it, or B, put yeah. it in the abdomen. Both of those are fascinating. Yeah, cryopreservation, or we used to put it in the abdomen. I think most physicians now have went to the cryopreservation. It works really well. Yeah. We don't have to worry about giving them another source of infection by putting it in their abdomen. But um, so, Super interesting, lots of broken bones if you work with trauma. Um, that's the kind of things that you see. And that was my favorite type of patient to take care of when I was in ICU. Like them all, any critical care but traumas were always what I thought was interesting. Do so you can go to the next one? Let me see if I can find oh, an image here. of a craniotomy and then I can yeah. try to put it up there. Yeah, please do. Okay. I will look at it. Pictures are my favorite part. So. This is just a couple more pictures. This patient right here has what we call a halo, this big black um, metal, I don't know how to describe it. So he's got some sort of neck injury high up, like right here. So your cervical spine. You have seven vertebrae that starts at the base of your skull and goes down just to the top of your neck. And if you fracture one of those top couple, you may see some kind of a brace like this called a halo. You have to hold that very still. Um, I don't know if you all ever heard of like a hangman's fracture, um, where that very top vertebrae will, if you move your head just right, you could break your neck. So they put these on. And these um, nurses assist neurosurgeons with putting them on. They have little screws that attach them to your skull and that hold you very straight for an extended period of time. We've had patients go home with those on. 
they're, they're not comfortable. You can't move much, but it does allow that bone to heal. So kind of interesting you see that with trauma patients sometimes. Did you find one? Yeah. I should have put that in. Oh, yeah. Due to the need for not graphic because of school, though. Yeah, it's fine. These this, this you is get the it. cartoon images. Yeah, yeah cartoon, cartoon images. Ones. It's okay. That's fine. So here's where they've taken out what we call a bone flap, and they would let that brain swell out. And then later they can go back and put it in. They can open up the same spot, put it back in, and your bone will grow back together just like when you break your arm. You can, it grows back together, so it's pretty cool. Um, now while the patient is has the bone flap out somewhere, we have to protect that brain once it stops swelling really careful because it's right under the skin. So, so you might see a patient walk around for a while in a helmet to give them that added protection like when they go home or when they go to rehab, something like that. There was one that looks oh. like, it, that's what it looks like. Yep. Black. Yep. It's just black. So if you work on a neurosurgery team uh, in the OR, you would probably get to see one of these. If you work in the ICU, you won't get to see them while the brain's exposed, but you will see, um, you know, the swelling. And the brain, when it swells, it will actually um, curve out. Uh, they, they will, um, depending on how bad the injury is. This is just another patient with some extra things on, a uh, ventilator, and we've got heart monitor going here. And he's hurt his arm. So he's splinted, and that's all kind of things you would see in ICU. Can you go to the next one? I think. Is my, the, is, I'm sorry. No, is you're the fine. Trauma ICU like different than like if someone is a, a really like so they're really old and kind mm -hmm. of really bad shape. Mm -hmm. Would they go to the same ICU as the ones that are trauma? Or so at St. Francis, at big, we'll say at bigger organizations, they have separate ICUs. So medical. So if you've just got say heart and kidney and just older maybe and just a yeah. lot of, oh, your septic uh, infections went to your bloodstream, you would be in their medical usually. And then most of them, us included, have a surgical ICU. We use our surgical ICU for surgeries and traumas. Okay. Um, so anybody that goes to surgery that needs ICU would come there as well. Okay. Um, and then you have course of course neonatal intensive uh, intensive care for those little tiny babies um, at the big hospitals in st. Louis Springfield they have pediatric ICUs so peds patients would go there um, I believe Barnes has a burn unit like ICU we just don't see enough of those types of patients here to separate them out so all right next this is actually my daughter. A couple of years ago, um, this is my, she's 14 now. So a couple of years ago, she was at gymnastics. She loves gymnastics and she fell off the uneven bars. She was flipping over them and she landed and all of her weight went on her left arm. Now she only weighs, weighed about eh, probably 85 pounds at that time, but all of her weight went on her left arm. So this is what her left arm looked like when we got to the ER. Like she got an extra wrist. Yeah, she got a, it's not straight anymore. We got a little, you'll see when I show you the x-rays. Um, that was day of surgery for her and then that's just a different view of her arm. Go ahead and go to the next one. This is her x-rays. So this was the one that really shows you why that arm looks like it's kind of veed. Both bones are broken. And you can see from the top there, she got a fracture here, a fracture there, and a little bone fragment there. And she came about three millimeters away from it coming through the skin, real close. So that's a compound fracture. So they splinted her up. This was before they, um, they set the arm. And then this one over here was after. So it looks a little better. A little straighter, but that was before surgery, but after they said it. You can go to the next one. And then this is after surgery. She has two plates and 13 screws. So she, they took a metal plate and put in a bunch of screws. In surgery, fixed her up good as new. She's just fine. 
just some neat x-rays where you could see some broken bones. You can go to the next one. What do I what time do you guys get done? Four? Four. Okay. We can get done any sooner or later that you I just don't want to keep you all too long because I don't want to, you know, I can I can talk all day long, really, <laughs> about something. So after I left the ICU and that kind of patient, <clears throat> there was a job opening for something called clinical documentation improvement. And uh I had little kids at home, and I was working like swing shift, nights, days, weekends. Life was crazy. Kids were little, and I saw an opening for this job. They were creating this position for um, three of us, three positions. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to check that out. It said I needed to have a broad background in nursing, and I needed to know how to work with some doctors, and I've done that for a while. So I got hired. Uh, a few years ago for this this role. So this role takes a professional nurse or a certified coder um, and we ensure that the medical record of the patient is accurate, complete, and reflects the severity of patient's illness. You guys don't know doctors as well as I do, but they don't really tell you a lot about the patient in their documentation a lot of times. It's better now that we have what they call the electronic health record. But at the time I started this, we were still writing on paper at St. Francis. So one of my favorite surgeons, um, I always got a kick out of him. He would have a patient that came in with a broken femur, so this big bone in your leg, um, that had to have surgery and multiple other things. And his progress would note would say 10, 17, 23, broken leg. Really? You can't. I mean, so this job was all about getting the physicians um, and nurses and other medical people to tell me what's really going on with your patient. If it takes you two hours to see your patient in the ICU, tell me why. And if they weren't telling me, then I work with them, uh, with physicians and the advanced care providers like your nurse practitioners dietitian, speech therapy, occupational therapy, to get them to tell me all about what is going on with their patient. Which doesn't seem like that big of a deal, except that the way that our country gathers data on patients so that we can know what's going on with them here, right here in southeast Missouri, um, what diseases are the worst for our area? How do we know? We know from patient docu from documentation. Then our documentation then goes to a coder who puts it in with these little codes and that's the data that Medicare and insurance and, and all the other regulating bodies out there, that's how we collect data. So researchers, colon cancer and heart failure and COPD are three of the top um, diagnoses, diseases here in southeast Missouri and we know that because for years we've documented and collected that data so we know we have a higher prevalence of those things. So that's kind of in a nutshell what documentation improvement does. All of the documentation improvement specialists at St. Francis were all nurses. We all have a wide variety of clinical background. We can go read a chart. I can read an ICU chart and I can pretty well imagine that patient in my mind and what's going on. And I've learned over the years what to ask the doctors to get the specificity and the severity of illness that we need to go along with the coding. Go ahead and go to the next one. So what do I do all day as a documentation specialist? Well, some people tell me it's boring. But now that we're electronic health record, it's a lot of computer review. Um, I'm in those documents every day, look in, look at progress notes, look at lab work, try to correlate all of that together. Kind of the same thing I did at the bedside, except that I'm not at the bedside anymore. But I'm still using my critical thinking skills. Um, we work with prov the providers, we work with coding to fight denial. So hopefully, um, well, if you have medical insurance, if you have Medicare, Medicaid, whatever kind of insurance you have, private insurance, um, we'll send things in. They don't really want to pay for it. So we help fight those things and say, our patient really was this sick. We need you to pay, like, like you said you would. So we work with that. Um, we also, uh, my favorite part of this job, 
is helping to identify patient harms. So we have patients that come in, we want to make sure that we're not doing anything to hurt them while they're there. So an example of that would be my patient comes in and they fall on the floor and break their hip. What could we have done to potentially prevent that? Now occasionally there was nothing you could do, right? But did we have a bed alarm for the patient? Did we know that they, they trip and fall at home all the time? Did we have them on some kind of medication that made them a higher risk for fall? What happened? So that's my favorite part about this job. I like to investigate all those things. I like to try to make the care better for our patient, uh, more efficient. We don't want anybody to get harmed or have an adverse effect from anything that we're doing in our in our hospital or our clinics. Um, and there's folks that work in every organization to do that kind of thing. And we look at that stuff not only for us, but because those governing bodies out there, Medicare, Medicaid, government, Joint Commission, they require us to look at all of that stuff as well. So they're looking to, they're looking to see, does your hospital take good care of patients? Or do you have too many of these patient safety events? So we're heavily involved in that. Um, and then we look for other ways to just improve things. If we've got a doctor's office that patients are telling us it takes them two and a half hours to get into their appointment, well, why? And that's more what I'm doing in this new role with Ava's mom. So go ahead and go to the next one. Um, this is just more about what documentation improvement. We look at the documentation for specificity, um, ambiguous documentation. We'll work with the doctors to work through that. We'll do the next one. Um, more, just another little, I think I was just happy making slides. I think mm -hmm. I was just having fun putting slides together. Just, whoop. Anyways, you're fine. So, um, Performance Improvement Specialist. That's what I'm doing now. And I'm working more with those things uh, like we were talking about. Right now I'm working on a project where a patient needs to wear a heart monitor and maybe they can't get an appointment for three months. Are you serious? We need to move that along. So I look at processes. What are we doing? What's slowing us down? Um, I work a lot with IT. Anybody interested in computers? Like computer stuff? Yeah, so I had no idea when the electronic health record came along that we were going to have so many uh, computer geeks out there that work for a healthcare system. And I say that term lovingly because without them, I wouldn't make it through a day. If these people are phenomenal, the things they can write and they make our electronic healthcare record do, it, it's, it's crazy. But we work with them to um, improve our efficiencies across the board. Um, you're fine. I can't remember what else was on there, but it doesn't matter anyway. So that's pretty well been my career over the past 20 years. I've been a nurse for 20 years. I have no idea what I'm going to do with this master's degree that I'm getting. Not real sure if something will come about there in the hospital that I want to do or if I'll do something else. I've been at St. Francis all but one year of my 20 years. I did a little bit of work at a doctor's office for a while. So what do you all want to know? Have I put you to sleep? Not completely. The, the school day did that to them. It's not your fault. It's okay. My work day does the same to me. Everybody's no worries. very, very tired today. It's okay. This morning and did not It's a gorgeous day outside. But, yeah, me too. I heard that all, until I walked out to my car log. I was like, oh, they were right. It is really nice. So there's tons of opportunities. You're not limited. Um, healthcare, it's not going away. There's tons of opportunities to just different things you can do. Um, oh, it's, yeah. It's better than I would be doing because I barely got the link sent to you. I was stressing out a little bit. So. We did. Yeah. We made it work. It's all good. Yep. We got it.
So some of the people out there, looking back at a couple of slides, um, yeah. You should be able to just now just swipe. Okay. Perfect. This is probably the way to go. Yeah. To we can do that. Um, governing bodies of healthcare, Medicare. Um, can I swipe on here? You said. Yeah. You should be able to. Oh, on the on, on the, the tablet tab. there. Perfect. It's back up. There we go. Yeah, now so CMS, Center for Medicare, Medicaid, they administer our program, uh, Medicare program. They're part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. We work very closely with them in the department that I'm in now. Um, there's tons of programs out there and ways we get paid and all the rules, and we make sure we're abiding by those because if it wasn't for Medicare and their payments, we couldn't keep our doors open. Okay, we just have to have such a large population of folks that are on Medicare. Um, they want us to provide access to high quality care and improve health care at lower costs. Health care is expensive. Um, you guys may not know that, but I bet your parents do. Um, everything costs a lot when you're talking about health care. Um, they look and analyze that data and they tell us, hey, you're doing a good job or you're not. The other people that came in, come in, and they were just at our hospital yesterday to check us out. The Joint Commission, um, they're nonprofit, independent. Uh, they set standards and accredit your healthcare organization, so your clinics and your hospitals. And they evaluate uh, more than 22,000 healthcare organizations and programs in the United States. Um, so they come in, they come in and look at everything and make sure that we are doing it by best practice, by the standard that's out there. Um, so is there like uh, like a software that you put all of this stuff into that's like kind of universal? So we have some softwares that we use um, that helps us catch like patient safety issues and that kind of stuff. Um, we use uh, information from Joint Commission. There is a, a an application they have available through, through them that tells us what every standard is. So it's not a trick. They're not trying to, to surprise. I mean, they do surprise us when they walk in, but their standards aren't a surprise. Medicare's, uh, CMS's standards are not a surprise. It's all out there for us. Um, but a lot of it is, unfortunately, we read these manuals and we learn. We read, we do a lot of research. Uh, my department, Ava's mom does tons of research. She knows stuff for the, our clinics that I'm thinking I'll never know. but. She knows tons of it. Um, and then the exciting part is just when you think you've got it down and you know all the specifications for a specific program, they change it yeah. and say, hey, we've got new things. we got updates. Oh, we took that away and we added this in. So on a yearly basis, we work with people as they make their updates, including my IT friends. Um, they are instrumental in making sure we keep up off all of this and building it into our electronic record. So I already kind of told you a little bit about what performance improvement we work um, just to try to improve patient care and the outcomes. Woo. <laughs> work with ambulatory clinics and inpatient areas. My specific role now is ambulatory clinics. Um, identify process issues. We help make new processes. What's an ambulatory clinic? Outpatient clinic. So a doctor's office that you would go to. Okay. Like um, family care um, here in Jackson. Because I think ambulance when you say ambulatory. Yeah. yeah, me too. But they recently started calling this ambul outpatient stuff ambulatory across the nation. So it's our new word at the moment. But it's any clinic that we have. So an orthopedic clinic like... We have a group of orthopedic doctors over in Cape. Their clinic is considered ambulatory. We can walk into it, get care, and leave. It's gotcha. kind of how they explained it to me. Um, so we educate staff on new processes. And then we have what we call a command center. So in times of survey, like yesterday when the Joint Commission walks in, or if we would have some kind of disaster, uh, my department also helps with the command center. So we help organize everybody, um, figure out where everybody needs to go and where they need to go and what they need to do. And we kind of help run that hub. So that's always really interesting. 
Um, we learn a lot every time we have surveyors. We learn a lot every time we have bad weather and we have a, if we go under what we call a code gray at the hospital where there's potentially tornadoes or one's been spotted within a certain radius, we have a command center. And that's just to help ensure that we're taking the best care of our patients, our visitors, that we can. Um, any questions? Yes? Um, so, I've, been, I've just been like curious about this like a lot, because you know, like it's just always in my head, but like, what made you choose nursing school like over medical school? Like, was it good to do more? Is it that you have more opportunities? Or? So, coming out of high school, I was pre-med. Um, I went to a little bitty high school here in Southeast Missouri. Has anybody ever heard of Zalma High School? Okay. Graduated from there, 1999, 20 people in my class, okay? Ava and I were talking about this a while ago, how many people, the seniors, there's like 500, this is crazy, this high school is crazy to me, but little bitty high school, I love science and math, and I'm like, medical field just intrigued me all the way around, so what do I want to do? I want to be a doctor. I was sure of it until I got to college. I started the pre-med program at Mizzou, and I just found out more of the requirements and what I was going to be doing and I just just didn't see myself doing it but I was still really interested in the medical field so I started looking what can I do and I got involved with nursing and started checking that out that's the route that I went I actually ended up coming back home going getting into nursing school at Three Rivers Community College and doing my ADN um, I was looking to save myself some dollars since I'd already spent a couple years at Mizzou. My parents might have been looking to save some dollars too, I'm not sure, but anyways, and then ended up at SEMO finishing up. Um, so I don't know that there was any big thing under, I just didn't feel, personally for me, I didn't think that I was gonna be willing to put the time and dedication into the pre-med program plus medical school, plus, you know, I kinda like my family and being around, but. A lot of folks start out one way and switch. Um, there is such a thing as going to nursing school and then becoming a physician. Uh, we have family practice doctor. Her name is Dr. Price. I think she's retired now, but she was actually a nurse for several years before she went back to med school. And she was amazing because she knew all the little things that nurses did for patients. Um, there's lots of options medical school-wise. You can. You know, you could do a degree in biology, um, you can do the pre-med program, you could do chemistry for medical school. There's also some physician assistants out there, which is a really big thing around here. There's nurse practitioners as well. So you think in pre-med? That's right. Yeah? Where are you going to school at? Do you know? Are you a senior? I'm a junior, but okay. I have, like, my whole list out. It's kind of a lengthy one. I just kind of want to go to um, BYU and then... Penn State and then uh, Washington. Good for you. I like having a plan. I always had a list and a plan myself. Any other questions? I think just a comment. Like it's you, it was a great example of like that medical field has a lot of room for upward growth. There's a lot of jobs that you end up in. Like this is it. It stops here. This is what you do for the rest of your life. But like yeah. just in your example, like you went from LPN. Mm -hmm. And you did that for some years, and then right. you got, did your bachelor's, and now you're working on your master's in, in nursing yeah. leadership. Like, there's a lot of room for growth and, and, and places to go and find, find something that works, and then think, hey, there's the next thing I want to do. So you're not stuck in the same exact thing. No, and you, you know, when I started in ICU, I was going to be a nurse anesthetist. I was sure of that, too. When I got out of school, I loved ICU. So a nurse anesthetist is... Um, we have anesthesiologists in the OR that put you to sleep. Nurse anesthetist works under them. And they can also put you to sleep and, uh, for your surgeries and things, okay? Schooling is very intense. It makes, they make really good money once they get out. If you like working in the OR, it's another great option for you. And when I was in ICU, I thought, yeah, I'm going to do that. And then I met my husband. Then I decided to get married and have kids. And I was like, yeah, I'm done with school for now. And then here a year or so ago, I was like, you know what? My kids are getting older. I'm going to be at St. Francis for a while, probably. Am I going to stay in this job or am I going to move around? Well, let's go ahead and get a master's degree. So the options for you guys that are out there versus when I graduated high school and even college, 
this online college thing has changed everything in my opinion I can be a 50 year old mom of whatever I'm not 50 yet by the way but you can be 50 years old and decide you want to go back to school for a second master's degree or finish your bachelor's degree when I was in nursing school um, I finished up with some nurses who had got their associate's degree or their LPN and at 40 something years old or 50 actually one lady was in her 60s and she had always just wanted to finish that. She was an LPN and she wanted to finish that RN and she come back to school and finish it. So you're not limited. You can start one way and move laterally. You can move up, you can change jobs when you get tired of it. Sometimes hospital work is for some people and sometimes we have to have great office nurses too and school nurses. If you're interested in the medical field, find your passion. There's tons of things out there. If you don't know, ask somebody. I put my email at the end of the slide. You're always welcome to email me if you have questions. So, thank you guys for having me. Thanks for not sleeping. Sure. Yes, ma'am. I put my personal email in there because the work email won't let anything go filter.